uh, shut down all the Latin masses. So is it is crazy what's happening. I think I heard all the bishops did that. So no, I heard all the bishops did. Down. And they said, if you live in Middletown, you're doomed. See. All right. Any questions? Did you like Proverbs five? Like Proverbs. What should we do now? Next one. Six. Sister, you're getting smarter in your old age. You know, the more you learn of sacred scripture, the more you're what? Irresponsible. Irresponsible. So when you, when Vincent goes, it's you wouldn't want to be him and Marie on Judgment Day. So, Chapter Six of Proverbs. Um, as you can see in Chapter Six, Chapter Seven, and you can see why they were chaptered that way, because they start with the expression. My son. Sister Marie, how do you say my son in Hebrew? Benai. B E N A I. All right, everybody say Benai. Benai, if you have become a surety for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger. If you are snared in the utterance of your lips, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you come into your neighbor's power, go hasten and opportune your neighbor. If you said something to your neighbor, you've got to keep your word flowing through. Right here, amen. Now, in the Bible, in your faith, your word is your what? The word is your bond. Does everybody under, understand that? The underlying verse one is your surety. And it's, it means your bond there. And the neighbor means the person next to you. So please do not say something. Now, I shared with you a very big dilemma and none of you've ever answered it. Should you love people more in your house than the people next door? No. But do you? Yes. Okay. Do, um, does God get mad at you? No. But ultimately, what should we do is we love everyone the same. Now, is, do you think that's a hard thing to do? Yes. Do you need Jesus to help you? Yes. Now, when Jesus was working with his disciples, it sounds like three of them were always after him. Do you remember them, Vincent? Peter, James, and John. With these three disciples, does Jesus like them better than the other? No. When you keep seeking a person, when that person is sought after, then they they come and others to say, oh, they're your favorites. So when you have a neighbor, the big thing in the Middle East about your neighbor was me, it means the person next to you. And they were very, very concerned with moving your landmarks. Everybody remember what your landmark is? Your fences. Make sure you stay on your property. I'll stay on my property. So literally the word neighbor means someone very next to you. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, this is called the holiness code. In the holiness code, you're supposed to love your brother as yourself. You can get where Jesus taught us that in, in um, Leviticus 19, 8. So we have in the holiness code, 
make sure that you take care of your brothers. If you are snared in the utterance of your lips, and sometimes we say something and we don't carry it through. Say you live in Orlando, Florida, and you said, we got to get together sometime. But you know, the Italian restaurants have opened and they have closed. So we haven't seen hair in their hide of you. Amen. So watch out when you have wishes. And as I shared with you last week, the will of God. When you have wisdom, we do the will of God. When you have wisdom, what you say, you do. So watch out again, the, the lips. Now the past two sessions, we've been on watch out for the women, right? Now it's my, my benign. Watch out for yourself and your mouth. In the book of James, it is very dangerous to open it. And of course, in all of our positions, we know something of great and grievous importance that others do not know. But as a result, we can't say anything because we have been sealed. So watch out for the snare is the utterance of what you say. Now in Matthew 12, 32, we've been given warning that we'll be answerable to all that we have said. And this past weekend, I gave a big talk on no more cursing, no more profundity, and even avoid calling people boneheads. Amen. Though I don't think it's profundity, or I don't think you committed a sin, but build up whatever you say out of your mouth. And you're a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach. You give everybody else the power to say that to. Do you want to? Do you want to take that? So your words are your bond. So when we review our conscience every day, may I suggest to us that you review your conversations with people. When you review your conversations with people, may I suggest part two. What was your motivation in saying those things? Because I could say the nicest things to you and not mean a word. Amen. So watch out for the trap. Then do this, my son, save yourself or you have come into your neighbor's power. Once you say something, to somebody else, you're in their power. Didn't you say, and as soon as you said something, you know, people, people really, really find it difficult to trust other people. When you're an invalid and you say you're coming to visit that person, you better get there. You know, we can all say, oh, I want to do the nicest things in the world. But you've got to follow through. Whatever you say, you're in their power. And by the way, to get out of their power is to fulfill what you said. If you don't do it, the guilt can rise in us. Do I hear amen? Go hasten and inopportune your neighbor. Go do what you said to your neighbor. Amen. Go do what you said you're going to do. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyes no slumber. Save your life like a gazelle from the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go do what you said you're going to do. Now, if you circle the word there, uh, gazelle, they, they, they're a graceful animal. And they, I, I always call that word gleep. 
they're just gleeping through and they're bouncing through the whole um forest there they just keep bouncing and it's used in the book of song of songs so go do what you said now your your mouth is very very um when we go through proverbs your mouth is the power to curse or to bless in fact if we were to teach you better you don't even have to go to a hospital to pray with the sick your mouth could heal them right now do i hear amen but you don't know how to do that so guess what you don't do that now everything we say is is being recorded on the eternal on the eternal dime so i love that don't even when you when you go to bed say all right i said this to the person when am i going to keep it when am i going to do it then in verse number 6 we get the example of the ant the ant go to the ant oh sluggard boy we we're, we're put down there you little sluggard consider her ways and be wise what do ants do when you look at them they go at rapid speeds don't they they're always about so the ant is using the ant like saying it in spanish the hormiga the, the the when the ants are really working you you never see an ant just sitting around smoking a cigar so when you see an ant especially the red ants that are coming into vincent's house at this very minute and by the window that he tries to put me in they're all about and they never never sit still they're always about going up and down when you block their hole of where their little nest is they keep working to get the dirt they never stop so in the scripture movement is always linked to an ant so when you when you, we study these little creatures it's absolutely a phenomena that our friend you know because interestingly when you read first kings 4 solomon was interested in in the animal world does everybody know that no miss kathy he didn't say the two dogs go to heaven but he was so interested in the animal kingdom of how they operate so he went all the way down to the ground now a sluggard it does what lazy. it's lazy it doesn't move and it might move an inch an hour right a amen so when you see them moving very slow and i i just shake at the at the the reality that um in the um in the very essence of uh, one day a, a boy was playing outside and he decided to dare and double dare and when he dared and double dared he said to his friends let me eat a slug yeah. don't do that well here's the end result he's dead he he's dead because the slug paralyzed him and uh, so there's a there's a little warning brothers and sisters that all of us all of us should be like the ant not like the slugger amen so that poor little boy is dead i think he was in his teens and they thought they could uh because he's young and his digestive system can handle a sluggard. Please, can everybody promise me you won't eat a slug? Even chocolate covered ants. When I was in Mexico City, they had what do you call those locust for sale in the, the, those little um, plastic bags. Did I eat one? No. I would have passed it to Vincent any day to eat those little 
and all, all of a sudden their legs were all up in the air. Biblically, you can't eat locusts. Does everybody know that? Okay. You can't. Because John the Baptist ate locusts in the desert. So it is permitted in the book of Leviticus to eat. But can you imagine all the stuff Marie eats with her Italian food? Oh my, the yeah. stuff there, the scongili and everything else and everything else they're cooking. I, I just shake, that's why I stick only with spaghetti and meatballs. Do I hear amen? Without any chief officer or ruler, so consider her ways and be wise. Now remember with the ant, is someone guiding them? No. Yeah, you can eat that. You can eat a locust. So they just go about because they have within their system, know what to do. How small can they be? How big is their brain, right? And they're about without any um, chief officer or ruler. But we have who? God. She prepares her food in summer and gathers her sustenance in the harvest. And you can see them sometimes on the backs of, of ants. They're carrying things and everything else. So they're always in preparation mode for the next season, what, what they're going to be led to. So can you see why the, an ant is considered to be the wise one? How long will you lie there? Oh, so you know, when you look at a sluggard, come back in an hour, and it's still up there. Amen? It doesn't plan to move very far. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a vagabond and want you like an armed man. The way I was raised is I hate seeing anybody idle. I mean, I just, and and that's why people yell at you, because you're doing what? You're sitting around. And with the old-fashioned people called the what? The Protestant work ethic years ago. Nobody was allowed to sit around. If you're sitting around, who starts to yell at you? Your spouse and your whole family start to yell at you. You've got to be about the kingdom. Because every one of us, no matter how old you are, is supposed to hold up your hands before God and say, bless the work of my hands. Bless the work of my hands. So nobody is allowed just to sit around doing nothing. Do I hear amen? Amen. Amen. Do I hear amen, Brother John? Brother John, do I hear amen? All right, now. When you, when you are in the kingdom of God, you've got to bless the Lord and work in the kingdom of God. Do I hear? Amen. So that's why being the raised I was, nobody, nobody was allowed to, uh, and I picked up that message loud and clear. I left my house at the ripe old age of 18. And what was I doing? I never, ever to this day asked a person for any money. And I worked in the shop right in Milburn. Do you remember Milburn, Sister Marie? Have you ever been in Milburn? Sister Marie never visited me once and there to get linguine and her marinara sauce and her ragu sauce. Sister Marie is always preparing with ragu specials. So we can see, brothers and sisters, that are you a sluggard? Or are you an ant? How many are a little shocked that this is this is in the Bible? Now, if you sit there and say, I have no money, you are on the verge of poverty and you are on the word of being a sluggard. Amen. So watch out for poverty. Now, we're going to encounter, in the book of Proverbs, we're going to encounter prosperity, and we're going to encounter poverty. Mm. Now, poverty is not, uh, not a curse. Some people are born in poverty. But if they just sit around 
putting their antenna up and on their cell phone all day long, that can bring you to poverty. Amen. Please watch out another theme in the book of Proverbs. Prosperity means not what you hear on the TV. No. Prosperity means, Jesus says in John 10, 10, he's, he's speaking Italian. And he says, I will give you what? Abodanza. Now, when you get from God, the purpose of getting from God is to meet all of your needs. And number two, with the rest over is, is to help the poor who are generally in need. There's another theme in the book of Proverbs is that we can never let a poor person pass by us. We can never curse a poor person. St. Francis of Assisi warned his followers that if they cursed a poor person, they would have to take the coins that they would give the poor people, pick it up from the ground with their teeth, put it in cow dung. This is nice St. Francis, right? Do you like that? So we're going to see all those themes coming loud and clear. So we can see a little sleep, a little slumber. No one should be sitting home doing nothing. And so when I hear that you're not working in years, one man said, I'm, I don't have a job. Right now, there's so many jobs you can get your pick of anything you want to be. And you just cannot sit home and say, I'm not working. That is a feeble excuse. Amen. Because what happens is you start to take other people's money. Is that what you want to do for the rest of your life? It's time for all of us to start working. Amen. So that's why I, I pray for good health and I can keep going. In verse number 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with eyes, scrapes with his feet, points with his fingers, with perverted heart, devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he'll be broken beyond healing. Now, we get a description of the corruption of the human heart. In Genesis chapter six, I shared with you many times before, the Jewish understanding of a broken heart or a corrupt heart is what you bring upon yourself. Now, how do you know you have corruption? Here's what you do. Look at your life, amen? If anybody wants me to come in and look at it, I'll look at it. But you don't want me because I'll be too blatantly honest with you. So here's a wicked person. Now, if you underline the word wicked, remember I shared with you many, many, many times. The word wicked in the Bible is basically an unredeemed person. But when you read the wicked, for example, in Matthew 25, the wicked will be cast to the outer darkness, where they'll be grinding and gnashing of teeth. All right, number one. Now, when you're a wicked person, you curse a lot. You have crooked speech. You have scoliosis. Now, I want you, I don't want you to think of a person. We're not here to think of people. If you think of one person, brothers and sisters, that constantly curses, you realize they're not doing very well. And that their family life is terrible. And their interpersonal relationship is terrible. So, number one, uh, the wicked person has crooked. The word for crooked is scoliosis. Remember St. John the Baptist in Matthew 3 said that God, please straighten out my crooked, my crooked lion. Now, how many would admit with me a crooked path is more difficult to follow than a straight one is? 
notice on a straight path, I can go faster. How many of a car or a truck turned over when they were going that speed down a winding crooked path? We hear about those accidents probably weekly. And especially when it's raining and wet and up here in the Northeast, when it starts to snow a little bit, do you think it's wise to go around the curve lower? The third, the second thing is we wink eyes at one another. We wink eyes at one another and says, it's okay, don't worry about it. I cannot, I cannot stand that expression. Don't worry about it. All of us are asked to be concerned. Worrying is a sin. Philippians 4, 6. So when the second thing is that we get into scrapes and with our feet and we start pointing the finger. How many ever pointed a finger? We start the what? The blame game. So when all the others are called, let me tell you about a person under addiction. Again, I did a series and Miss Kathy will send you the, if you want, how to get out of your addictions from 1 Kings 19, which is the first reading this weekend. Now to get out of your addictions, you've got to stop taking your index finger and pointing it at another person. There are two things you do which really are rocking your inner man and your inner woman. Blame and complain. Anybody ever complained before? Hmm. So the blame and the gun. Paul warns us against complaining. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. So we got a, so a wicked person blames. So right on the get-go, Adam has the what? Blame game. The woman did it. The reason why we blame and wink will take care of this is because of we'll get ourselves out of this. We will slide ourselves out of this. These are now people, it's building on this, which we're going to get to in a second. These are the people God detest. This is the spirit that cannot work in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're going back with me to Exodus 5 and 6, this is building on what is called the broken spirit. When you live a life like this, more and more and more, you will see the poison enter your soul. When the poison enters your soul, you will become least and least and least likely to be saved and redeemed. When I was studying more about Calvary yesterday, I again saw the spot where it's believed Adam was buried. Adam was buried right at the bottom of Calvary next to a man called Goliath. That's where we get the word Golgotha. Do you remember we told you that? So now we can have here, this is who we are next. When we, when we are evil, we have, we point the finger, verse 14, we have perverted hearts. Now, remember what your heart is. Everybody remember what your heart is? All right, let's review. It's your soul. It's your intellect. And it's your mind. Your soul. Your intellect. And your mind. That's why it's very difficult, extremely difficult to walk the walk with Jesus because the arrows are coming at your head constantly. Now, you can all say with me, I love Jesus. Easy. Easily said. But until my mind, my intellect are really walking together. And what else? My mind, intellect, and my soul 
I am not walking with Jesus. So when I'm baptized, I am redeemed by Jesus. But when I, as soon as I walk out of that church, I'm still ready to go a different direction. How many ever had a case? You went to confession. And as soon as you were out in the parking lot, you started again. Because your mind, your intellect are still ready to run in a different direction. Do I hear amen? Next, another characteristic of a wicked person is to show division. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14, the God that you love only is the God of harmony. Now instantly, instantly, <coughs> there is no sneezing. Instantly, you can tell whether God is there. When there's dis... We're having sneeze breaks over here. Instantly, you can tell when God's not present in the moment. People yell at each other. People curse. People talk evil against each other. God is only with the harmony flowing. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, that we must always seek the unity of believers. Jesus mentions that in John 13, 35. So what does an evil person do? Sows discord. Loves to get people all upset and riled. Amen? For example, say we're all sitting calmly down and having a good dinner. Yoki bolognese and spaghetti and meatballs and uh, salad and everything else. And all of a sudden, people start bringing up controversial stuff about another person, everything else, or that we're going to disagree. That's the discord of a wicked. Whoa. Next. The next thing you know of a wicked person, they're living in one calamity after another. Now, we all have our difficult moments. Everybody shake your head yes. Amen. We all have our moments. And boy, you could just cry with all of our difficult moments. But brothers and sisters, we should never have a moment where we hurt one another. And yet, what do we do? We love to do that very often. Do I hear amen? So that's why it's very good for us to go into our man caves and stay there for a long time. That's why I said to St. Benedict when I was in Subiaco, Italy, I got to take you there, Brother Peter, and say, you know what, Benny, move over. Just send the Italian bread down. Amen. So you, we cannot stir up. Our whole thing is unity. Now, look at, now do you understand why, Vincent, we question people when they want to be healed? In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. Now, everybody write in there, underline that, broken beyond healing. I think you should all have underlined in your Bible by now. Now, can I heal somebody beyond healing? All right, let me, should, let me again repeat to you what that is. Because sometimes I pray special prayers. Even for my Michelle. Did you ever pray special prayers? Now, if you go to exit, and this is the most difficult thing that I, I cannot hear this. 
if you go with me to um, the uh, chapter six of Exodus. Well, let, let me back up. Let's go through a few things to pick up what a sluggard is. So what are you, a sluggard or an ant? Amen. Now, when you look at verse number um, 17, the Pharaoh was quite annoyed at the chosen people of Israel. He said, you are idle, you are idle. Therefore, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Of course, he was wrong. They were being beaten, so he wasn't idle. So now, verse 22, chapter 5, verse 22. Then Moses turned again to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why do you let this evil come upon our backs, literally? Why did you ever send me? Here I am, Lord, send me. Right, do you remember that? When, when we have this, um, if you go to verse number 10, the Lord said to Moshe, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, let, this, let the sons of Israel go. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? Who am I? A man of uncircumcised lips. Now, who said that before or afterwards, I should say? Isaiah. If I'm going to serve the Lord and not have this spirit upon me, what do I need to do to really walk in the health and the power of the spirit? I cannot have uncircumcised lips. Now, who else had the uncircumcised lips? Goliath. Now, if you're going to pray for healing, when you pray over my lap, you're going to make sure your lips are consecrated. Didn't we just have at the beginning of chapter six, consecrated lips? Amen. When I go and ready to read the gospel, I make a sign and so do you over your mouths. Amen. In fact, my custom has been make sure I read a scripture to you before I preach to you so that my scripture to, to you will help set the tone where it'll be the word of God to you. How many want to hear the word? The word of God. So underline that there, verse, uh, verse 12. What is our problem? If we are wicked, it'll block us from speaking the word of God. Now, Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3 have given us all a warning. And the warning is so much so that the warning says to us that if you don't hear the word of God, you'll hear it from foreign people and you don't understand a word that they say. Look in verse chapter 6 of Exodus. Look at chapter 6 with me. Look at verse 28. On that day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Ani Adonai, the four letter words, Y-H-W-H. -H. Remember, every time you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in English. In Hebrew, it's capital Y, capital H, capital W capital H in Hebrew, you are not allowed to pronounce it. So please stop doing that because every time you do that, you use God's name in vain. Does everybody know that? So stop doing that. Amen. So we used to sing a song and under our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, wisely so he said, stop doing that. I... When he said that, I was standing up applauding because of my Jewish studies. Now look again, verse number 30. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How can Pharaoh listen? 
So, when you look at your lips, have you ever cursed? Did you ever curse in Italian? Yes. Sir? Did you ever be in a situation in that house of yours in Brooklyn where the Italian language came forth and they were bad Italian words? Sister, you're not confessing now. Amen. Now, when those bad Italian words are in the house, you better get your spray can of holy water and clean that house. Amen. I don't mean with Ajax or anything else. You need Holy Spirit power. Do I hear that, Mrs. Herbert? Amen. No cursing. Do I hear amen? No using God's name in vain. So are you getting this yet, brothers and sisters? Are you getting the idea that the people here are under lip control? And when we have evil tongue, we have an evil body. James chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. You cannot bless God on one side of your mouth and curse him the next few moments. Do I hear amen? Okay. So, um, when, when you see that, brothers and sisters, you can see you're opening the door to more and more and more and more evil. Do I hear amen? Now, back with me to Proverbs 6. I'm healing. And, and those, uh, I, I got to get that for you, chapter 5 and chapter 6. You have what is called a spirit that can't be healed. And only one person can heal that spirit. God. Now, did you look there in chapter 5 and chapter 6? I pointed that out to you way back when. Uh, let's see, it's in there. Look real quick. Uh, chapter five. This is called a broken, con broken spirit. Can't be healed of. And when people have broken spirits, the the evil that has been done cannot be healed with a pill from your doctor. The only thing pills from your doctor do is what? Knock you out for the night, and then when you wake up, you get to start it all over again. All right? Did you find it yet? No. I put it in your machine there. It's your five and six. We're staring, we're staring at it. Um, we, we, we've gone through the... Um, the um, I'll be right back with that. I'll get it for you. I'm staring at it right now. Um, now, in verses 16 through 19 of Proverbs, this is what God hates. Now, please check out and examine your conscience. Do you find it? Oh, chapter 7 and 10. So uh, when, you, when you examine your conscience, I want to put this on your examination table. Interestingly, you've been taught from Naperville to here. You've been taught when you prepare for confession to go through the Ten Commandments, right? Did you find it, sister? Isn't six nine most because of that broken spirit? Yeah, you got it. Six, six nine. Six nine. Exodus six nine. We found it. Okay. Exodus six nine. Exodus chapter six. Moses spoke thus to the. That's it. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit. When you have a broken spirit, it can't be healed. So now, say you have somebody you're trying to win to Christ, and they can't hear a word you say. It's because of their broken spirit. So you pray for the girl downstairs. Deaf and dumb spirit, we talked about that. Pray, spirit of infirmity, we talked about that. Pray for your broken spirit. Do you understand that? And now you know another thing. Pray against the uncircumcised lips. 
Now, let's let's put something perfectly clear. I am unworthy. I am unworthy. I am unworthy. Give communion. I am unworthy to preach the gospel. I am unworthy to stand in front of you. I am unworthy. And that's not the poor me syndrome. That's the truth. So when I hear you complain, oh, I can't, I'm not worthy. I want to scream at you in Christian love and say, get over yourself. We're all unworthy. And so I go nuts when you say to me, can I receive communion again? When I think of the great St. Francis of Assisi, he received the Eucharist in Italy. You know, tutta tutta in Italy? Four times a year. And you want to receive communion again? Oh my, save my soul, Lord. Now, what am I suggesting? Are you ready for this? Are you in Naperville? Are you paying attention? When you, when you say, I examine myself, now think, think along with me, I'll, I'll try to go slow. I want to examine myself by the Ten Commandments. What's wrong with that picture? Am I saying for you not to do it? No. But what I am saying for you, the Ten Commandments cannot be fully kept by all of us. The Ten Commandments goes back to the old law. Am I saying don't ever do that again? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, as you were listening last night, we're in a new covenant. Now, if we're in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit operates in us. And as the Holy Spirit operates in us, these are not the people we should be. What am I saying? You should see unbelievable victory in your sins that you don't commit them anymore. At the ripe old age of 12, I stopped cursing. I thought it was cool to curse as the neighborhood kids were. They would never say the words that are going on today. But why do I want to just be focused in on a covenant of the past when Jesus empowers me with the new covenant? What do I believe is your best outfit to really examine your conscience? To take Mark and you go for a holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Amen. Mm -hmm. Then you will receive the conviction you need to change from your sins. Right now, let's go to 16 to 19. This is what you should examine yourself on. Awesome. How many of you ever picked these? Maybe you want to take a... Uh, a camera a picture of it or just a little snapshot and put it next to when you examine your conscience. By the way, this is the first time you ever heard this teaching. There are six things in which the Lord hates. Um, seven things, which is an abomination. Now circle the word abomination. I'm in verse 16. When there's an abomination, it means, well, this, you ready for this? Hello? Are you ready for this? Even though you're going to Tyler, Texas tomorrow. Now, are you ready to see this? An abomination in the Old Testament means cut off from God. When you're cut off from God, you can see Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Being cut off from God means you don't belong to his community. I am so glad that our blessed Lord is the Lord of the 100th and millionth chance. So you all get 100 million more chances. Woohoo! And don't get nervous. I don't think you use up all the cards. When I was on this retreat in Colorado, 
Mother Teresa gave me a stack of cards for all my meals. I'm like, I don't think I even used any of them. So, um, seven which are an abomination to the Lord. Let's go through it. Number one, haughty eyes. That means you're better than people. It means you look up and you see yourself up there. Number two, a lie. Oh, there it is again. A lying tongue. God hates lying. Nobody here ever lied this year, right? When you lie, remember the Satan. The Satan has three things. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. And he's a murderer from the beginning. Everybody got that? When we lie, we copy our old father again. When you became a Christian, you are introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have a new father. Now here's the hardest thing for us to do. Put our old father to death. So number three, Hands that shed innocent blood. Hello? Somebody ring a bell? Ding! Who shed innocent blood? King David. Herod. Herod, right. The reason why David could not build that beautiful temple is because he had human blood on his hands. And God wanted nobody To build the temple. Now, would it shock you to know that in Bible times, Jews were never allowed to carry a sword by God? Did they eventually carry swords? Yes. Would it shock you to know for the first 300 years of Christianity, we never basically, basically killed anybody? Because there were 10 major persecutions. When Constantine in 313, with the Edict of Milan, saw the sign in the sky with his mother, uh, Queen Helena, and she got the true cross which you have in your house in Naperville. Now, would it surprise you to know we did not take up arms? Would it surprise you to know we are filled with arms right now. Ever since we became the nation that we could practice our Christianity, we took up our iron. When you read the Bible carefully, the Bible says, do not make altars out of chiseled with iron because iron is weapons of war. Now, say you are in Naperville and you have, you want the priest to bless your water, psh, 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 your salt, and your oil. Did you know what really makes them all holy? The Bible teaches us is not the blessing from the clergy, though that's good. What really makes them holy is the altar you put it on. Now, Miss Kathy, do you have an altar in your kitchen there? Now, when you have all the crucifix in there, did the priest bless your altar? Because your, your holy objects need to be on a holy place. Amen. Did you do that yet? Amen. We'll be flying out to Naperville tomorrow. I'll have dinner with Mark and we'll do it. I should go to Tyler. Amen. Are you seeing? And Nori's all happy about that, by the way. Nori's all excited. So now, what really makes everything holy is the altar. That's why in the Catholic Church, and I see abuse all the time, there should not be glass on it and flowers. 
even though Marie is decorated. No flowers on the altar, sister. Amen? Because Larry will hear about this. But when you have, Vincent, you have an altar in your house? Do you have a special place you'd like to pray to the Lord in your house? Then you got to find out your altar. May I suggest when Father Bill visits Dnieperville or Orlando, may you bless your altar. Sister Marie, do you have an altar in your house? All right, Brother Peter, do you have an altar in your house? I thought you would suggest that, Brother Peter. Look at look at the look at the hairs. Look at look at what you people have done to my head. Next, a heart that devises wicked plan. Now the whole sense of a heart that devises wicked plans. Remember, we went into what the heart is, all those layers of heart. And you keep thinking about the next evil thing you would do. Feet that make haste to run to do evil. God hates this. Verse 19. A false witness who breathes out lies. Now, St. John the Baptist in John chapter 1 constantly tells us that we are witnesses of the Spirit. Do I hear amen? If we are witnesses of the Holy Spirit, that means we give incredible teaching to the rest of the world. Are we doing a good job, brothers and sisters? Are we really teaching them who Christ is? So, and look again, verse 19. A man who sows discord among his brothers. Have we upset the apple cart? Have we caused divisions? Have we opened our mouths and started trouble in, into our Christian family? We've got to strive for peace. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Those are the things God hates. And through a lot of them, we might classify them in our group called sins of omission. My son, Benai. Ever say Benai. Keep your father's commandment. Forsake not your mother's teaching. The father's commandment means I'm giving you guidance. Now, my difficulty with people is, and forgive me. Forgive me. I believe I know some good stuff. And when I ask people to, not to do certain things, and they do it, I go, nut. And then when they tell me their life is difficult, I don't want to put guilt on them. But if your life is going down a slippery slope, it's because you continually make awful decisions. And if you're told that, you don't want to hear it and you keep making them. But people don't want to be told. So we're told, number 20, verse 21, bind them upon your heart always. Now, how many have seen Jews with their phylacteries on their head? Everybody know what the phylacteries? And they wrap their what? Wrap their arm. Do you remember that? It has to be bound right by the heart. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, right? They put the little phylactery on their head. Wrap up, wrap up their hands, and it comes right here by the heart. Okay, now look what it says here. Bind them upon your heart always. Hello? Now, to be an Orthodox Jew today means you don't go to temple on Friday night, Saturday. It means you've got to live it every second of your life. Your religion so takes over you that you have to do everything it says at every time and everywhere. Do Christians believe in the same thing? Yes. Do we obey by those laws? No. So that's why when I'm talking to my millionaire friends and they keep saying they're doing this, that, and the other thing I said, 
that's not good. And that one called up the other and said, I, I don't like what Father Bill was saying to me. Hello, you opened your mouth. You, you revealed what you were doing, I commented, amen. So now put a little note there, tie them around your neck. Now, do you understand Jesus's words? If you lead a little one astray, it'd be, it would be better if a millstone were tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. Why was that a scary image? It's a scary image because it wasn't like the islands down in the Caribbean where you could walk in the water and see your little tootsies. It was murky, muddy water. So if I have a weight around my neck, now watch this. Is, are you getting good stuff? Mm -hmm. What is the weight around our neck? Turn to the person next to you. This is really good. The weight around your neck is when you struggle to obey the Ten Commandments and you don't keep them. That's what Jesus says. Now watch this. We're going to clear up something really good. You got to listen. When you obey God and come to Jesus for the rest that he asked to give us, it's when you decide to do it his way and win souls in the kingdom. Then you will come to rest and the yoke will be on him. So if I have the yoke on me, and the yoke is another word for the Torah. Because if you're Jewish, when this is starting to break out in the time of Shalom, you're getting all these laws to obey. How many would like to get the playbook? I love, I love school. I love going for my degrees. I love learning so much new things about the Lord. But you know what I heard the first week? They give you a syllabus about this big and say, I want the three papers. I said, I just sat down and you want three papers out of me? I didn't like that the first week. I felt burdened and yoked. And of course, the teacher says, well, let me look at your outline and see if I like what you have. So, but Jesus doesn't do that. When Jesus speaks of rest, he speaks of having a heart for people's souls. When you have a heart for people's souls, guess what happens? You're doing what I do. When you have a heart for people's souls, you want to be the best witness when you're in Tyler, Texas. You want to show the glory of God, the Shekinah on the outside, the Kabod on the inside. So when you look at them, bind. Now let's go back to the first binding. Where's the first binding? Deuteronomy 6. You're supposed to bind it on yourself so that your children will see it. In Matthew 18, we have a process given us by the Lord called binding and loosening. Now, some of you use that when you're praying over those interesting people in your Florida prayer meeting. Oh, you've got an interesting group of people. And they, want, they call me up and they want me to bind and loose. Amen. So now the binding and the loosening has got to go even deeper than what this says. So if you look and connect it to Matthew 18, 20, and 21, you'll see a deeper sense of binding and loosening. So much so that when you bind, it touches the very gates of heaven. Amen. Now, being the clergy is not doing a good job in binding and loosening these. 
I wanted I should I should do a whole session with you on binding and loosening. Would you like to hear that one? Vincent's already saying here for that. We don't know how to bind and loose properly. Amen. Now, did you ever hear of Sam Jacobs? Sam Jacobs went, Bishop Sam Jacobs went to Pope John Paul II and said, We can lay hands on the sick, we can anoint with oil. But now, when you hear the local clergy, they don't even want you to do that. So, I love verse 21. Isn't that a great verse? How many know it just opened for us a new vista? When you walk, now, sister, how do you say walk? Halach. Remember we gave you that word many times? Now, I told you in Arabic, when you say the word Yisrael, not in Hebrew, I'm giving you Arabic now. In Arabic, the word Israel means to walk as quick as you can. The word that the Lord gave me this weekend, the word was, the Holy Spirit says, your doors are wide open now for the favor of the Lord to come through and that you will have more opportunities than you can imagine to get this word out. Amen. And tell the man in Woodridge, New Jersey to move. Do I hear amen? Now, when you have that power of the spirit, when you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. Hello. I was like Deuteronomy 6 again. When you walk with your children, when you lie down, when they go to bed, now, when you had Jason and Megan and Christopher, you pray over them every night. Then you didn't follow Deuteronomy 6. You had Michael and John. Did you pray over them every night? When you had Melissa and Jason, did you pray over them every night? Do you pray over your kids every night? You having your children, and I want to hear an amen out of you, treasures. Mm -hmm. All your kids are still treasures, amen? Even those grandkids of yours, amen? Did you pray over them when they're in that other room next to mine? Six. Six. All right, see, see, see in Deuteronomy 6 when it says, lie down and walk? Hmm. Now, let me get you excited about this passage. If Shaloma is mentioning right here in verse 22, lie down and walk, what's happening in Israel right now at this point? Again, ready for the third time. No. Now, at this time, right, when they're, when they're speaking this, Oh. They're finally opening the Torah to the people. Do you see the cross reference that they're producing? Hmm. It's opening. Now, I, I've taught many times that the Bible started to be written down in the year 1000 BC. Look at Shalomo picking up on it. So I, this is just an educated guess, Papa. Could it be? Question mark. Right now, Shalomo is reading Deuteronomy 6. Could it be? A thought. And when they awake, you will talk with you. Hello? That is such Deuteronomy 6. Yes. Now, when your kids woke up, when Megan woke up, when Jason woke up, when Christopher woke up, did you talk about Jesus in the morning? When you get my Elise and Cecilia, you take them into the grove. Did you say the rosary with them? 
Because you know what they're going to say? My grandmother, Nana, from Illinois, she prays with us. And what JJ did to you was he thought you knew all the answers about God in the world. Do you remember those moments? They were such blessed moments. And when Cecilia and Elise come up to you and start asking you questions about God, more than your daughter-in-law and more than your son, they're going to think you know all the answers. Don't tell them you don't know all the answers. Just rejoice in the question. One day I was driving my nephew. He's a grown man now. He says, Uncle Bill, I know a whole lot more about life than you do. And I said to him, kid, I'm really, really happy for you. And he says, but, okay, what's your but? He says, I think you know a little more about God than I do. At least I have something to share with you. See, I didn't put him down say, you smart Alec. <laughs> no, I gave him all positive answers. Amen. So if you box in 22 there. For the commandment is a lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my life and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a light unto my path and a light unto my path. Bum, bum, bum. Amy Grant, look, listen to it before you go to bed and watch your bobbleheads behind your head. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. Give me the ways of God. Give me the Bible. Give me the truth in which I could walk. So put a star there. That's really good. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Discipline me, discipline me, discipline me. I thank God for the holy Benedictine nuns that I had. Oh, they were great. I walked in there. And I thought I was saluting the nuns every day. My sister, reporting for di duty. And she would never let me call myself. It was William. You are William and you will like it. Yes, sister. My name is William, sister. Yes, sister, reporting for duty. Amen. All the kids said, William, I'm like, oh. William, my name is William. And so, so underline that Psalm 190, it's a lamp. So you got to put the light on your feet where you're walking. Now, put in Hebrews 4.12. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. That's Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, chapter 12, uh, verse 5. When you are under the Holy Spirit, if you're a disciple, ready? Say to the blessed Lord, preserve me. Or you say to the Lord, keep me. Or you say, you, you, ready for the hardest thing to say to the Lord? Correct me. Amen. How many want to say to the Lord, correct me? Amen. To preserve you, we're, we're done. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adventurous. Hmm. Do you see a father keeps mentioning? Here she comes, just a walking down the street, singing, ooh, a diddy, diddy, dum, diddy, do. Yes. Watch yes. out for the virus. Watch out for the kid. He's always warning his kid. Watch out for the women. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff, Brother John. Amen. Brother John is new. He joined us last night at the church. It's good seeing Brother John uh, getting into the word of God. Now, Brother John, we have 5,000 CDs for you to listen to. I expect you to listen to all of them by tomorrow morning. Amen. 5,000 CDs. 
Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Heavenly Abba Father, we just thank you for this session in the power of God, in the might of God, in the working of God. We thank you for chapter six of Proverbs. As we go all the way to chapter nine, we get the whole understanding of how to live in the grace of the sacraments. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, ever shall be, without end. Amen. Brother Peter was.